when we're in a rush, when we're in that busy mode and feeling stressed, the hardest thing in the world is to stop. You stop at everything in your body and your mind is still like charging forward, trying to get to and finish things and check things off the list. And it's really physically uncomfortable to pause. Have you noticed that? Yeah. So what stops us is that we have behind the lines always in some level humming away in us an existential fear. There's some perception of our temporariness and some fear around what's around the corner is ultimately loss. Loss of our own bodies, loss of other bodies, loss of what we love. And that apprehension, that apprehension keeps us tense so that we spend many moments trying to defend against loss, trying to predict loss, in some way trying to occupy ourselves because when we're not occupied, we have to face the rawness. So in this culture, it is pretty aggravated. We have a, what many have called a death-denying culture, where we are hell-bent on dominating nature and putting a stake in the earth saying, I exist, you know, ideally forever. And, there's, and we then try to kind of fight away any sense of vulnerability by continuing to grow and expand and spend more money and buy more and do more and consume more. It's, it's an addiction. It's this constant expanding and just moving faster and faster and faster. In some way, if we move fast enough, we'll beat the shadow of death that we always sense over our left shoulder, as Don Juan, the shaman, says. So what our culture admires? It admires the kind of people that are busy and larger than life in some way, that stand out. So how we present ourselves to others, what we present is usually the doing self, the self that's out there doing things. I mean, how often have you been in some conversation, you know the basic inquiry is not the deep who are you, but the, well, what do you do? And that's what we present. Some of you might remember the story of this man that was driving in the backwoods of Montana and he sees a sign saying, talking dog for sale. So he rings the bell and the owner appears and tells him the dog's in the backyard. And um, the guy goes in the backyard, he sees a really nice looking Labrador retriever just sitting there. You talk, he asks. Yep, the lab replies. <laughs> After the guy recovers from the shock of hearing the dog talk, he says, so what's your story? The lab looks up and says, well, I discovered I could talk when I was pretty young. I wanted to help the government, so I told the CIA. In no time at all, they had me jetting from country to country, sitting in rooms with spies and world leaders, and, you know, because no one figured a dog would be eavesdropping. <laughs> I was one of their most valuable spies for eight years running, but the jetting around really tired me out. I knew I wasn't getting any younger, so I decided to settle down. I signed up for a job at the airport to do some undercover security you know, wandering near suspicious characters and listening in. I uncovered some incredible dealings and, you know, I was awarded a batch of medals. Got married, had a mess of puppies and, you know, now I'm just retired. <laughs> the guy's amazed. He goes back in and asks the owner what he wants for the dog. Ten dollars, the guy says. Ten dollars? This dog's amazing. Why on earth are you selling him so cheap? because he's a liar. He never did any of that shit. <laughs> so, it's a little bit of a strange idea of this, you know, we talk about human, where instead of being a human being or a human doing, and this is a canine doing, you know. <laughs> but the truth is that we do organize our sense of self and our activities around some notion, some expectation that more doing is better. We're safer if we do more. In some way it's our protection against the shadow of death. Mm -hmm.